And today, it's my great honor to co-moderate this meeting with Dr. Jian Ping Chao from Zhenxin General Hospital, Taiwan. We also have some panelists to join the discussion, including Dr. Huai Jin Tan from Singapore, Dr. Ellen Yong from USA, and Dr. Zhong Ming Di, and Dr. Yong Chou Kim from Korea. As we know, the collaboration between TTT and the TCTAB has been maintained for many years. The relationship between TTT and the TCTAP is very good and close. Through this platform, we can learn the new knowledge and the information and the shared experience with each other. Today in this section, we will have debates on the issue of multivasal PCI in STEMI patients. Multivasal CAD is observed in about half of the STEMI patients undergoing primary PCI. Optimal management of non coupled regions in this uh, setting continues to be a matter of debate, especially in patients with cardiac shock. So far, we know that the results of complete revascularization are better than incomplete revascularization. However, the timing of PCI for non coupled regions is controversial. One stage or two stage, which one is better? especially regarding the STEMI patient with cardiogenic shock. The cardiogenic shock trial showed that the 30-day risk of mortality was lower among those who initially underwent PCI of the cardiogenic region only than among those who underwent immediate multivasal PCI. However, the Kamiya NIH registry from Korea showed that low risk of glucose mortality and less need for repeat revascularization in a non infarctated artery by one year when they undergo complete revascularization. The result was totally different from Capri shock trial. Therefore, I think this issue needs full discussion in this uh, joint section. Today, we invite Dr. Jun Wei Li from Taipei Market Hospital and Dr. Feng Yu from Kaohsiung VGH to express their opinion and the debate regarding this issue. I think it will be very informative and useful for our audience. At first, I would like to invite Dr. Jun Wei Li to present his case. Thank you very much for your joining. Thank you. Um, my name is Jun Wei Li and I'm from uh, Makai Memorial Hospital. And today I'm very honored that I have this chance to be here and share the first case with you. And today I stand for to support PRO and uh, uh, on the multi-vessel PCI in STEMI case, patients. And I would like to share a relatively uh, uh, a special case for, with you. Okay. Uh, this is a 55-year-old gentleman, and uh, he came to the hospital because of a sudden onset severe chest pain. As you could see, the ECG, you could see obvious, obvious ST elevation in the anterior lead um, from um, V2, V3, V4. You could see there's an obvious ST elevation in the anterior lead. And emergency... Uh, a PCI was uh, indicated. And this is his right side. You could see there are some lesions uh, in the RCA middle and there are a uh, relatively tight lesion in the RCA distal. And meanwhile, you could see there are some collateral circulations, no matter from uh, the PDA to septal to LAD. We then move, move on uh, to the left side. As you could see the uh, the left side, uh, the LED is, as are expected, it's uh, totally occluded. Meanwhile, uh, you could also see the red arrow as that there is also a tight lesion in the circumflex. The green arrow points out the place where the LED is totally occluded. And you could also see there are some diastasis in the LED total occluded territory. And we did some uh, thrombosuction, but the flow is still very poor. And so we did repeat the thrombosuction again and again. And the patient symptom relieved a little bit. And however, uh, after 
uh, a few management, the, the flow, we did regain the flow, but uh, the patient uh, feels sudden recurrent chest pain again. And at that time, we saw the there's a no reflow phenomenon. So, uh, so the case is like the LAD is totally occluded and we did some thrombosuction. It did, the flow did improve a little bit. However, the patient, after a while, the patient uh, has a recurrent chest pain and the angiogram shows that there's a no reflow phenomenon. So we did, uh, adenose, we did some management, including uh, uh, ad adenose injection. However, something bad happened that the patient had some side effect of the adenosine and they, we saw that there's an obvious bronchospasm. Although the blood pressure is relatively stable, it's like the systolic blood pressure is 132. However, it, the patient had the lip and the, the appearance shows cyanotic and the SPO2 is like uh, 71% and it's obviously desaturated. And Meanwhile, the patient started to have drowsy consciousness. So we did uh, some emergency management, including we gave some bronchodilator and intubation for uh, airway protection. And after a, a while, the condition improved gradually after, after uh, the intubation with uh, mechanical ventilator support. And so we keep on the PCI and um, we did uh, the a few management and then the, we regained the TME3 flow of the LAD. So uh, we, this is a summary of the, the vessel. We have a totally occluded LAD and we did the thrombosuction and we could see there's a 50% lesion in the circumflex proximal and 80% in the OM2. And there are like 60 to 70% uh, stenotic uh, lesions in RCA. So this is a triple vessel. And we decided, first of all, we decided to place a drug eluting stand in the infarction related artery, which is the LAD. However, consider of triple vessel disease and some financial problems. Uh, we explain the condition to the patient and the patient is willing to receive uh, bypass surgery. And so we uh, did the internal mammary angiogram and prepared for uh, bypass surgery. And we also contact the cardiovascular surgeon. And during um, waiting for the surgery three days, in, within three days, the patient was in the ICE intensive care unit and another episode of recurrent chest pain with cold sweating attacked again while waiting for cabbage. And he changed, at, Probably because of this episode, he changed his mind and he decided to receive uh, intervention. And about the financial problem, he said he could fix it by borrowing money from his friend. So uh, what should we do in this uh, circumstances? We decided to repeat the PCI with functional guide. Our plan is like this. First of all, we'll still uh, ask the pre stick to the previous plan. We'll place the drug eluding stand in the uh, car carpet lesion, which is the uh, infarction related artery in LAD. And then for uh, the, the rest of the two vessels, which is the circumflex and the RCA, will try to use a functional guide to define whether it's a true triple vessel disease or, or whether it's a, a functional triple vessel disease instead of an anatomical triple vessel disease. And we'll, because a uh, consider of his previous heart uh, condition, including the bronchospasm, we'll try to avoid adenosine. So we would choose IFR instead of FFR. So this is the angiogram. And then we uh, placed a drug eluting stand in the infarction related artery, which is the LAD. And then after we, you, uh, we did the functional test of the RCA, although there's a lesion in the middle and the distal part, the IFR level from distal to middle to proximal is like 0 0.95, 0 0.98, and 0 0.99. So this, we don't need uh, any PCI for the RCA. And for the circumflex, the IFR level is 0 0.75, which is... Um, which didn't pass. So we placed a 
drug eluting stand by image guide uh, a 2.75 uh, drug eluting stain, the circumflex. So this is the angiogram after the intervention, you could see. So this is uh, the case summary uh, for the for the triple vessel STEMI patient. Uh, for the cupboard lesion, which is the LAD, we did thrombosuction. We initially, we planned for a cabbage, but some episode happened. So eventually we put a drug eluting stand in the LAD. And for the non cupper lesion, uh, for the circumflex, the IFR level is 0 0.75. So uh, we uh, put a drug eluting stain in the circumflex. And for RCA, since the functional test IFR is 0 0.95, so we leave it alone and no PCI was performed. So uh, this STEMI triple vessel disease patient, we, uh, by the functional guide, uh, after after the functional guide, it's not a triple vessel disease anymore. So we did the complete revascularization um, uh, by functional guide and eventually we put a drug eluting stand in LAD and circumflex. And that's the summary of my case. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Lee's very nice uh, case presentation. Is there, is there any question for this uh, case presentation or comment? No, can I ask you a question? Sure. Yes. <clears throat> so what, what was the status of chest x-ray at initial presentation? Were there yeah. any pulmonary edema at the initial presentation? Oh, I didn't put the chest x-ray in the, in the slide, but um, the patient condition was relatively stable. I mean, initially probably, uh, probably it's like a KILIP one or two, but uh, the patient uh, situation was very good. And uh, although the situation initially was very good, but in our hospital, we'll still usually give some uh, oxygen with very low support, just like a, a per minute, a two liter per minute nasal cannula. Mm -hmm. But uh, the x-ray was fine. Okay. Yeah, can, can I can can I ask? Is there any GP two B three A inhibitor is available in your country? Uh, yes. Uh, in my hospital, there are. In before we have three kinds, but right now our hospital only have one kind of glycoprotein two B three A. And by the way, the patient uh, just uh, 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 extubation, like the the next day, just after the episode of the bronchospasm. So it's like uh, the intubation is just like for the sudden episode of the sudden spasm of the bronchus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Lee, can I have a question? Sure. So I'm Dr. Chow from Jensen General Hospital. So uh, a very, a very good presentation. So uh, some trials uh, suggest that uh, thrombosuction uh, has no beneficial effects in STEMI patients. Yes. So do you do the thrombosuction for, for all of your STEMI patients or selected patients? Yes, uh, indeed, the, the, the study doesn't show uh, very much uh, benefit for routine thrombosuction. Uh, but in my personal experience, we, we don't routinely use the thrombosuction in STEMI patients, but usually if we according to the angiogram, if we, if we could uh, obviously or identify there is probably a thrombus over there, usually probably it's uh, either there is a flow reperfusion or not. If you could obviously see a thrombus over there, uh, in most cases, we will do the thrombosuction. But in some STEMI patients, when the angiogram shows that it's reperfu uh, uh, reperfuted and probably there's no very obvious or uh, large loading of uh, big thrombus loading, probably we won't uh, do the thrombosection. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Yong Chul Kim from South Korea. Thank you for your nice presentation. So I have a uh, question and there's a comment is so why why did you the injection of glyco 2 b 3 inhibitor just after uh thrombosuction 
Oh, actually, we did not use the glycoprotein to be three A inhibitor. I was just answering the question, but、uh, in this case, we did not use the glycoprotein to be three A. We used the adenosine for the no reflow phenomenon, and that's the only the 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 only the specific medication we additionally use in the first. Yeah,、time. yeah. So, so what I'm saying is why、uh, why not. did not yeah why? Oh,、uh, yeah. um, probably it's because uh the after. After、uh, in the intubation, the patient's、uh, situation improved, and、um, we we did some management. But、uh, the the condition we regained the TME three flow, so probably we didn't move on to the two B three A. But indeed, if、uh, we still cannot、uh, regain TME three flow very quickly, probably we will、um, consider to use.、Um, Glycoprotein two B three A inhibitor, because、uh, the guideline in our country, the STEMI guidelines, the two B three A indication, it's like two B recommendations for,、uh, especially for, for a huge big thrombus load. So it it is one of the option. Probably, if、uh, we still cannot gain the TM three flow for another three or five minutes, probably we will. Uh, perform two B three A inhibitor for this patient. Yeah, yeah, but in this patient, is just after you are getting the TM three flow is、uh, flow is、uh, really limited the situation, right? Yes. So and then is the I I I think that is that that timing is the suitable for the injection of the glyco two B three A inhibitor. Additionally, adenosine. Okay. Yes, probably.、That? Probably, if we do this the next time, then we won't、uh, become. This case will be better. <laughs> yes,、yeah. I do believe it's a good timing for、uh, to use two B three A more earlier as an option. Yeah, and this,、uh, I I have one more quick comment. Is、uh, yes. I think it's a、uh, yeah. It's a you your comment is that that is the、uh, is the just the slow flow, but、yes. but is the regarding the is angiography. Showed, I think is that、uh, you are,、uh, you use the is more uh, uh, bigger uh, is uh, balloon inflation. Yes, I think is a flow limitation. I I I think is that that looks like a flow limitation is is not is the slow flow. I think. Yes, probably、okay. because the time is limited. We have to move to the next case presentation. So Dr. Guo, are you ready to present your case? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. I'm Dr. Guo from、uh, Kaohsiung Veteran General Hospital in Taiwan. Uh, this is a 66 years old male hypertension and smoking one pack per day. He presented into our hospital in uh, uh, February uh, 2018, and this is the, his ECG in our emergency department. You can see the、uh, typical finding of the inferior STEMI with the、uh, reciprocal change in the precordial lace and even the、uh, V6 have the ST elevation. So. We think this is very emergent, and、uh, we just do the、uh, primary PCI for this patient.、Uh, this is done、uh, later after after PCI. This is the echocardiogram, but、uh, showed hypokinesis of the LV and several wall got、uh, impaired LV function, and the ejection pressure was only forty percent. And this is、uh, by transradial approach.、Uh, in our hospital, we、uh, often use uh, uh, echocardiogram guiding catheter in.、Uh, HS cases, especially STEMI, because we can uh, we can uh, do the、uh, angiogram simultaneously, either left or right. And by this angiogram, you can see、uh, the right coronary was the totally、uh, subtotally occluded, especially in the middle part. Maybe this is the carpal lesion here.、Uh, this is the middle part, but you can see the collaterals to the left side. That means that there may be critical stenosis in the left uh, uh, left side、uh, artery. And this is the left side artery. You can see, however, the circumference was totally occluded, and、uh, the LED was also totally occluded. So this is the a very poor condition, and、uh, the diagonal branch was got、uh, severely diseased at the very、uh, austere portion of the diagonal branch. And to what a pity and what a misfortune, this is the biggest diagonal in the lateral wall. So in such kind of circumstance, I don't know.、Uh, 
who will do the complete reverse calculation or just do the copy only, and which one is the copy? Is the second flex or the uh, right coin rate? But uh, in for my personal opinion, maybe the right coin is the copy of this time. Uh, so I just uh, do the uh, right coin intervention, and I would like to show you a close look why I don't want to do the complete reverse, reverse calculation because you can see that in front left side angel gun, you may see it seems that there's a uh, micro channel between the proximal LED to the distal LED. However, if you take a close look, uh, I don't think maybe I think maybe it don't uh, he don't have a, a micro channel in this uh, uh, middle part of LED. So I don't I don't think it is suitable to do uh, such kind of of LED in a steamy setting. So I don't. I cannot see very the uh, any great channel, so I just do the uh, copy only. Uh, I just do the right coloring, and this is synthesis one score thirty nine, and synthesis two is forty. Uh, if PCI is forty nine percent, of course we suggest uh, this patient to do the bypass surgery, but the patient just uh, refuse immediately uh, after our recommendation. So. Uh, what to, how to do, and would you still recommend the patient to underway bypass surgery or just do the carbon lesion and a stage PCI for this patient? And he can, we can make an open discussion after uh, my talk. So I think maybe uh, I would do the right coronary and stay PCI over the uh, LAD. Okay, sorry. And this is the during uh, right coronary intervention. I just pass the XDA to the distal part of the right coronary, and um, actually it's not so hard to pass the XDA wire to the distal RCA. And then it's not so uh, hard to do the stenting, and this is the uh, final <laughs> injury. So in my conceit, in my in my uh, current uh, practice, I think, especially in patient with impaired LV function or impaired renal function or in patient with cardiogenic shock, I think maybe the uh, PCI over copy vessel is a better choice, uh, especially uh, the copy shock trial tell us that uh, maybe if we do a uh, multi-vessel PCI, we will uh, have a, a worsen renal outcome <laughs> And maybe the contrast will induce the, uh, the uh, impaired LV function. So maybe I think copy only PCI is the better choice uh, during the uh, STEMI cases. Of course, we can uh, have a lecture later and uh, regarding the new uh, recommendation of guideline, we know that maybe in some cases we can do the multi vessel PCI at, at one time. But I think still in some cases, we should do stage uh, copy only PCI and then do stage in uh, some cases, especially in those with impaired LV function, impaired renal function, or the root is not so clear in other vessels uh, with uh, critical stenosis. And this is my case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for Dr. Guo's very nice case presentation. Any question for this uh, case presentation? Dr. Oh, Go, I'm Dr. Chow. Yes, Dr. Chow. Yeah, very good, uh, very good case. And I also agree with your management because um, this is a, a triple vessel disease patient with STEMI and the poor LV function. If you if you treat the patient with um, uh, three vessel PCR at the same time, I think the patient need more support. Yeah. Uh, maybe he, he would need a mechanical circulatory support device like yes. uh, ECMO or at least yes. IDP. And then the patient can um, can uh, uh, survive after your your three three vessel PCI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree with your with your management. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about what what happened afterwards. You actually end up the patient going to surgery or a second stage uh, circumflex, um, maybe attempt of the LED. Or what happened after the the? Uh, actually, I complete uh, the. Uh, Revascularization at the stage and the LED was CTO and use I was guided to diagnose and see the channel of the LED CTO OCN and then pass the wire to the LED distal. 
and uh, I can show you actually the stage, uh, the stage PCI, uh, the final. How I do later is uh, in the stage PCI, I do the left side by seven page guiding caster using IVAS to the LA, uh, diagonal branch and finding find the Austin of the diagonal, uh, the LED and using the guide one. And you can uh, actually, uh, as I try to pass guide one, I also use simultaneous uh, IVAS guided. This is uh, IVAS in the uh, diagonal branch and this is the uh, uh, wire in the uh, LED. This is guide one wire. And you can, if you see IVAS, from the diagonal branch, and you can see that the Gaia one wire was in the lumen, and I can then pass the wire very smoothly to the digital LED. So uh, this is the stage PCI. I do I was guided intervention uh, from the diagonal branch and using the uh, I was to find the channel of LED using the Gaia one wire pass and map confirm the lumen uh, of I was confirm that my wire was in lumen not in sub intimal or in plug. And then pass the guy one to the digital part of LED and do the final. Uh, this is the image that I passed the guy one wire uh, by store floor law. You can see the, under I was guided, my wire can pass to digital LED very smoothly. And then uh, do the IVAS. Uh, if can I, I see your slides? Yeah, if I, I can, oh, so you cannot see my slides? Yes, we cannot see your slides. Sorry, we cannot. Yeah. Sorry, wait. So, Dr. Kuo, my question to you is uh, how soon after the uh, STEMI did you perform this stage uh, PCI of the LED? Uh, actually, two months. Is. Two months later. Yeah. You know, that then lies the questions of some of the uh, trials uh, that have not uh, really addressed. I think the trials uh, tells us that. Uh, or, or, or that it is it's not the question of whether we should be doing a total revascularization, but rather the timing of uh, when to do the revascularization. Right now, we still don't know whether we should do it immediately or stage it, whether we should do it during the hospitalizations or after discharge and, and after discharge, how long is that good enough? And we still don't know, we haven't sort of uh, stratified patients by the lesion complexity. So it's quite different between a... Uh, a tight LED and a CTO uh, as to the timing of revascularization. And also, we also never stratify by the amount of ischemia that the patients uh, uh, non carpal lesions are sustaining. So these are some of the issues that we still have to deal with, uh, even with all these clinical trials that have been done. Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, because I think the LED was not so, uh, so I think it's a CTO. So I can show you the, uh, this is, uh, I just, to a French guiding caster using IVAS to LAD diagonal branch. And this is IVAS and find the uh, Austin of the LAD. And this is the Gaia 1 wire. This is IVAS, uh, real time IVAS uh, guided to find a channel. And I think the channel is here. So after I pass Gaia 1 uh, a little bit, I just do the IVAS and found that this is in a diagonal, uh, IVAS in a diagonal branch. And this is Gaia 1 in the LAD. Uh, lumen. So if you see the Y here, I think you are in lumen. So if Y is here, I think you are in the intimal space. So at the next slide, I will show you that this is the from the spider uh, view. I just passed the guy one wire very smoothly to the digital part of LAD. So I think the IVAS guide is very important if you see the ambiguous cap of the uh, CTO part. And this is the final angiogram of the uh, LAD. I think because it is CTO, so I'm not doing it very uh, in a very urgent fashion because I think uh, it is a grand total occlusion. Of course, I fix the circumference on the same time, but I do not do it immediately because of uh, I think the LED was uh, I need to have a plan and uh, make sure that I can uh, finish uh, the procedure uh, very smoothly because uh, I think according to the um, syntax trial, if a patient with a money vessel, uh, cabbage is much better than PCI. That's because of the low mm -hmm. complete revascularization rates of the uh, syntax one trial. So on the syntax two trial, if you can do complete revascularization and the outcome is, uh, is relatively well as the bypass surgery. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. That's okay. And, yeah. Okay. Because the time is limited, uh, we have to move to the next uh, speech. I would like to invite Dr. Junwei Li to present the, the title is uh, Multi basal PCI in STEMI patient is indicated. So, Dr. Li, please. Uh, I do agree with you all and. Uh, uh, we really, uh, according to the current ev evidence, we still not uh, very sure whether which timing is the best time for um, uh, the total revascularization. Um, for example, like the case which uh, Dr. Guo just mentioned, it's a um, complex, very tough one, tough CTO lesion. Probably you need a um, even if it's not in a STEMI condition, you probably need a well-prepared, well-planned, and probably it's um, you don't have that much uh, time to con consider that much or uh, preparate, make enough preparation for the, uh, for the CTO intervention. And of course, uh, I would like to share something, uh, some of the recent, like for example, the meta-analysis in uh, 2020, and uh, about uh, the the prospective of or the the, the view view of points of the multi vessel PCI. Um, I'm asked for this. Uh, this is always like a balance um, for whether uh, which which decision is better for our patients. Whether we uh, complete revascularization it right now or during this index event of ho during hospitalization or uh, probably do, a, do the revascularization a few months later. Um, there are many uh, specific studies, just like uh, you all just mentioned, um, including whether the patient's in a shock condition or not. Uh, uh, different studies have different views. And uh, this, I would like to share two um, studies. Uh, or some systemic review uh, during the last year, within one year. This is uh, uh, published uh, in January of 2020. It was like uh, the meta-analysis of the RCT of uh, STEMI, uh, consider that complete revas revascularization or not. And as you could see uh, during uh, the, if you are considered of MACE, uh, of course, they have different, uh, these two meta-analysis, they have different inclusion criteria. But uh, you could see for MACE, it's uh, more favored uh, complete revascularization. Of course, many of the trial d does re uh, exclude the uh, cardiogenic shock patients. And for, for uh, the mortality, it's, you also could see it uh, has a slightly favorable uh, uh, for a uh, favorable uh, result for the complete revascularization. And as you can see, the, com the, the conflict of interval is 0 0.56 to 0 0.99. So probably it's statistically uh, favor complete or slightly uh, favor uh, complete revascularization. And of course you could see uh, for other aspects, uh, you also could see it's relatively, uh, no matter it's a repeat revascularization or MI, it's uh, all like slightly favor the, the complete revascularization one. But uh, for MI, as you could see, it just crossed, uh, the, the hazard ratio just crossed uh, 1.0, so which is probably not that significant. And... Um, um, but if you, as concern of uh, contrast-induced nephropathy, we do have to pay for it during the, the same index event uh, for the revascularization. You could see that if we do the complete revascularization, for sure, we'll need more contrast. And that will have a higher proportion of leading uh, the contrast-induced nephropathy. And uh, for stroke, it's like also crossed the uh, 1.0. So it's a little bit uh, close to the complete revascularization, but it doesn't pass a uh, 1.0. So it's not significant enough. And so uh, during the conclusion of this study, he thinks that complete revascularization was, has a significantly lower rate or a lower risk of MACE, cardiovascular mortality and repeat revascularization um, compared with you only treat the cuprate lesion. Uh, 
And of course, for stroke, for MI, it's, um, it doesn't have uh, any significant benefit. And we have a slightly increased percentage of uh, contrast induced nephropathy. So the results suggest for certain cases, complete revascularization with PCI following STEMI and multivessel disease should be considered. A few months later, a different, different uh, meta-analysis of the similar issue published, and they have a slightly different uh, criteria and some more ev some different uh, evidence, but uh, similar results. As you could see, they their endpoint they combine um, death and 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 myocardial infarction. And uh, no matter you choose fixed effect mode or random effect modes, it all shows superiority uh, with the uh, endpoint plus uh, death plus MI. And uh, meanwhile, uh, you could see that uh, uh, the it also uh, for cardiovascular death is also showed superiority. And uh, for reinfarction the conflict interval is slower and it still shows uh, the result is favor complete revascularization. And for repeat revascularization, it also shows similar results. So uh, the conclusion of uh, the second uh, meta-analysis also had similar, but uh, different data, but uh, similar results shows that in STEMI patients without cardiogenic shock, multi-vessel PCI could reduce the risk of death and non-fatal reinfarction compared with corporate vessel only PCI. And for our case, uh, we choose uh, functional tests. Uh, the, the reason why we choose IFR, as we just mentioned, patients were afraid of another episode of bronchospasm. So we first uh, have to be sure that uh, they have a certain high correlation between IFR and F FFR. And during the defined flare study, it also shows that it's comparable using IFR. So it has less adenosine effect and uh, uh, including bradycardia and bronchospasm, and it's also reliable. And for uh, if we wanted, to, we would like to do a complete revascularization in a co acute coronary syndrome or especially STEMI, uh, we should uh, do the complete revascularization under the functional guide. So no matter FFR or IFR should be suitable. Of course, this study is acute coronary syndrome, but not not only STEMI, but it also could show, shows that IFR and FFR is uh, reliable for um, during the acute coronary syndrome. And especially of considering, considering of STEMI, if it's a non corporate lesion, IFR is also uh, reliable for the non corporate lesion. So we, we also could see that you use functional guide in STEMI patients, which is but it's not a cupper lesion. A functional uh, test is reliable. So no matter FFR or IFR is reliable in STEMI non cupper lesion. So um, you could do the functional test in the STEMI uh, non cupper lesion for complete revascularization. And by the way, probably uh, someone would be curious about if we do the functional test in the cupper lesion. Of course, this is not the focus of the debate because uh, our debate is talking about the revascularization of non cupper lesion. But just to mention that for the cupper lesion functional test, of course, if it's totally occluded, it's another issue. But if it's uh, for the uh, cupper lesion and it's uh, revascular, uh, it's reperfuted. And uh, because of the IRA, there are probably micro uh, vascular stunning and partially obstruction. So it will reduce maximum achieved flow. So it will have a smaller, relatively smaller pressure gradient and it will cause a higher false negative rate. So probably if you really wanted to do a functional test in a cup lesion, probably even if the level is like 0.81, but it probably it's still, it's, it's still, uh, relatively ischemic. So low value 
its reliable high value may be underestimated. So this is a diagram of uh, uh, from some evidence, some literature. So to treat or not to treat the uh, multi-vessel PCI in STEMI patients, we will let the simple, safe, reliable, cost-effective FFR or IFR to tell us the answer whether do we need to treat the other vessels. Of course, um, this is not include the condition with cardiogenic shock. Thank you very much. Okay, on the next, uh, it's, it's your turn, Dr. Guo. Actually, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, as long as functionally significant lesion in coronary artery, we need to we need to complete revascularization if the lesion is, is significant by functional test. Uh, what I want to address uh, especially today is that in which kind of condition we should not do complete revascularization in one time. Because um, some, uh, some evidence just tell us that we should not do com uh, complete in, in, in this procedure uh, but if the patient, just like Dr. Lee uh, just said, if you do the complete revascularization, you can decrease the rate of myocardial reinfarction. So my topic today is want to address that multivessel PCI and STEMI. Let's pause and review the data before we change approach to reperfusion therapy for STEMI. Actually, the guy is always continuous updated from the 2011 to 2015 to 2011. 2018 and 19 for ESC. Um, especially for STEMI, we should do the prime PCI and it's much better than uh, thrombolysis. Uh, and we all know and we all, all do, we all do uh, this in uh, current practice. And prime PCI is recommended, especially in patients with cardiogenic shock. And this is uh, 2011, but we are not sure we should do non carpal lesion at index procedure or a stage PCI at late time. But in the 2015, non carpal PCI may be uh, done in stable uh, STEMI patients. This is upgrade uh, to class 2B in 2015. But now in, two, uh, in 2018, uh, routinely revasculation of non infarcted artery lesions should be considered in STEMI patients with uh, multivessel disease before hospital discharge. This is 2A indication and level of evidence is A. So I think. Um, we can do complete revascularization, but not in uh, in this procedure, or maybe not in other circumstances. Uh, I mean, I agree with that. We complete the significant stenosis lesions, but if not functionally significant, we should avoid to do the uh, revascularization. And in which condition we should not do complete in one time especially on the cardiogenic shock. So I will focus my uh, following speech, uh, focus on the cardiogenic shock. Actually, in uh, the past, in 2012, the stem, multivessel PCI in STEMI was a class 3 indication in 2012. But in 2017, uh, it is a class 2A indication. And STEMI with cardiogenic shock in the past, it is 2A indication. And uh, now, is in 2017, uh, it's still in the 2A uh, indication. But um, this is 2A. But according to the uh, cardiogenic shock trial, uh, we can uh, analyze some uh, outcome, including the real outcome or other outcome in one month and in one year. Uh, according to the uh, many uh, registry, we have uh, got 10 observational studies in uh, meta analysis, including IBB shock 2 trial and coming and others. And some is to the carpal vessel only, some to the mild vessel. And you can see that in the cardiogenic shock, in the, according to the registry data, and our mortality that carpal vessel maybe have a better uh, mortality. And this is carpal shock trial uh, conducted in uh, Europe and Malay Center, uh, including the 83 centers. And this is flow chart in, including uh, one uh, 700 patient, uh, one, uh, and one, uh, 351 done a carpal lesion only, and, uh, 
the 355 underwent manifest of PCI. And at one, uh, one, one month outcome, the carpet vessel only PCI have uh, better or cost mortality as compared uh, with uh, uh, complete, uh, a carpet only have a better outcome uh, as compared with immediate multivessel PCI. That is in the past days, in patient with cardiogenic shock, maybe we can complete the revascation in cardiogenic shock. But now in the carpet shock trial, you can see that in a 30 day outcome, maybe carpet only PCI have a better or cost mortality. And uh, of course mortality is better in the, uh, the P is uh, significant in uh, one month's uh, survival. And in the renal replacement therapy, it trend to, it had got a trend to do the carpet only because of the P is uh, 0 0.07 and uh, maybe the carpet only PCI have a better uh, renal outcome as compared with immediate complete revascularization. But if we do uh, the long-term outcome analysis, it published in 2018 in NJM, you can see that uh, regarding the one-year outcome, actually the uh, mortality rates or uh, of course mortality is the same in a cardiogenic shock, either underwent carpet only or multivessel PCI in one time. So the conclusion of this uh, one-year outcome in carpet shock trial, that is the risk of death of radon repression therapy as three days was better in uh, carpet only PCI, but the one-year outcome regarding the mortality actually is the same between uh, carpet only or immediate complete revascularization PCI. So I think in cardiogenic shock for a short term benefit, maybe we can do the carpet only, but in the long term outcome, actually there's maybe uh, no difference. But there still have some argument uh, between these uh, two, uh, two uh, different uh, conclusion uh, and some uh, also uh, some, some doctors uh, uh, address about the uh, uh, underpowered for a uh, 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 one year outcome. And this is another meta analysis uh, comparing with uh, carpet vessel only uh, versus multi vessel uh, PCI in ACS with cardiogenic shock. And you can see that regarding the uh, long term outcome, uh, regarding the breathing, long term mortality, or reinfection, uh, short term mortality, and shock is the same. But carpet only vessel PCI have a better renal outcome as compared with the complete revascularization. You can see that very clearly because you need to use more contrast if you finish all the procedure. In, in this procedure, you will use more contrast and especially in patient with cardiogenic shock, it is easier, it's easier to have a renal value in a patient with uh, too much contrast. So uh, multivessel uh, do not uh, provide additional reduction in short or long-term mortality in patient with cardiogenic shock but the, the rate of renal failure will increase if we do the complete revascularization. And also in, uh, according to the European guidelines, uh, in cardiogenic shock, routine revascularization of non-IRA lesion was not recommend, recommended in a prime PCI setting. And this is uh, another paper. They also agree with that in patient with a STEMI with cardiogenic shock, we don't need to uh, do the multivessel PCI. And multivessel PCI uh, maybe not uh, have a better outcome. The patient may be down the stage PCI, uh, and uh, if you uh, done the PCI with patient with cardiogenic shock, you may need mechanical uh, support to have a better clinical outcome to reduce the long term mortality. So my take home message is that first of all, I agree with the complete revascularization in patient with functionally significant lesion in the coronary arteries, but maybe in a stage patient, stage PCI status. Um, in patient with cardiogenic shock, maybe we should do carpet only in a acute setting, in an index procedure, because in patient with cardiogenic shock, you may, if you finish all of the lesions, maybe you just do the lesion not need to treat, and you will use too much contrast and uh, the patient may suffer from a better, uh, a worse outcome in the one month follow up. So maybe in patient with cardiogenic shock, we should not do multivessel PCI. But in STEMI without cardiogenic shock, 
without uh, impaired airway function or without other com too much comorbidities. Uh, you may do complete revascularization in a stage PCI, uh, not in the, in this procedure. I, I remember uh, actually in the past we ever reviewed the paper regarding the uh, index procedure finish all procedure or stage PCI and complete or, or copy only and uh, left the uh, other lesions untreated. And the answer is that the best condition, the best uh, clinical condition is in stage PCI, but complete revascularization. Either you, we need to identify is that the lesion is significant or not. So functional status, uh, functional exam is very important and uh, post-procedure intravascular image I was re I also recommend recommended uh, intravascular image after procedure to make sure the optimization of the stenting. Thank you for your attention. Okay, okay. thank you very much. And uh, regarding this issue, I want to ask uh, the opinion of our panel panelist regarding this issue. What's your opinion, uh, Professor Ellen Young? What's your opinion? Thank you. Um, I think uh, our presenters are really summarized this uh, topic very well. Um, I think the question is mainly that, uh, you know, the conclusion that if you are, have no cardiogenic shock, I think multivessel PCI can be considered as a good one. But I think it's so many variables in that particular decision that we have to be a little bit more aware that uh, a guideline is a very broad uh, recommendation for uh, a group of patients. Um, for example, in the first case, I think there's maybe some indication that the, the MI is a little old, meaning that it's not uh, really, you know, first six hours because you can see the ST changes have been sort of evolving a bit into the biphasic version. And the behavior when you wire it is, you know, the, the clot doesn't seem to go away. It tells you the thrombus may maybe a little old. So you have to be aware that, you know, how, how well you're going to open up that vessel and what you need to do, for example, potentially, you know, a 2B3 agent. And I'd love to use uh, nipride rather than adenosine just because of the complication that you may see in the acute setting. So I use typically, um, you know, using a, the using the suction catheter and using it to actually deliver drugs distally to open up the microvasculature. So the, the part to me that triggers uh, what you think about the multivessel is really whether you have a successful culprit PCI. If you have a very relatively straightforward, uh, successful culprit PCI in a non-shock non situation, then maybe consider other vessels. Um, so I think that's, you have to fine tune a little bit on the patient uh, situation and how successful your, uh, uh, and your PCI is. And, you know, again, staged is the question as uh, Wei Chim talked about. It, I think there's no rush sometimes, you know, because it could be three o'clock in the morning doing your procedure and you might not be the best of, of scenario with support and so forth. So uh, deal with what is the most important for a patient, get them stabilized, and then think about the other lesions uh, in the same hospitalization or later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Alan. And how about Wei Chim? What's your opinion regarding this uh, issue? So my take here has always been that it's not a question of whether to do, but when to do. But another important question that perhaps has not been addressed by the speaker is that how do we assess the non culprit lesion for revascularization? Mm -hmm. Should we always have to use a functional assessment like a FFR or IFR, or is angiographic assessment good enough? Because if you remember the trial earlier on, like a PRAMI and a culprit trial, they were all based on angiographic uh, assessment. And in those trials, there were benefit in terms of heart clinical endpoints of reduction of all cause death and myocardial infarction. But when you look at the pre trial and the compare acute, which uses FFR, there was no benefit in terms of heart clinical endpoints. It was only a reduction in repeat revascularization that we see in those trials that use SFR. The largest trial that we see is the complete trial. Complete trial show a reduction in heart clinical endpoints but it's got two different criteria. If it's more than 70% stenosis and geographically, just go ahead and revascularize. But if it's between 50 to 70, then do a functional assessment. So the question now is, do we have to use FFR all the time or do we use uh, angiographic assessment? Mind you, that when you do FFR, you could be looking at a 90% stenosis and FFR is normal, but in a patient who just have a STEMI, 
is that a stable lesion, given that this thrombotic milieu has perhaps mm -hmm. incited some kind of inflammatory reaction in all these non culprit lesions that potentially may become destabilized and cause AMI? So there are actually a lot of questions that still need to be addressed in this particular scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. And how about Dr. Ju Myung Lee? What's your opinion? Yeah, I, I think the the Previous evidence strongly support the value of complete revascularization than the carpet only PCI. The matter, matter of the timing, where, which is staged or during the same hospitalization or separate hospitalization, is already touched by complete substudy, uh, which showed the both staged during index hospitalization and the separate hospitalization consistently showed the benefit of complete revascularization over carpet only PCI. And the simultaneous versus staged PCI issue, I think that is a clinical decision. That is not a matter of trial or study. It depends on patient status. And as we are clinician, uh, I think what that then needs our clinical judgment. And for the how to evaluate non corporate pressure stenosis. Both FFR and IFR can be used safely. And also angiographic diameter stenosis itself is a good indicator as demonstrated by complete trial. And for the cardiogenic shock STEMI patient, I think there is still huge debate about complete versus stage uh, corporate only PCI issue because many other studies including our one, which was published in JAG last year, strongly support complete revascularization over carpet only PCI. So I think we need more data about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So uh, because the time is limited, I have to invite uh, Dr. Chao to make a closing remark. Dr. Chao. Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning. And Yang, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Yang, uh, Yellen. So, um, so we have very interesting uh, topics uh, today uh, regarding multivasal PCI in uh, STEMI patients with current clinical trial completed revascularization uh, in patients with STEMI undergoing PCI is superior to incomplete revascularization. And this can, um, this can uh, safely perform as one stage for some, some patients or can be done as a stage PCI procedure. But uh, uh, the complete uh, revascular revascularization doesn't, uh, doesn't mean complete uh, multivasal PCI in one procedure. And it can be, it can be done in a stage uh, PCI during the index hospitalization or after hospital, hospital discharge within 14, 45 days, according to complete trial. So complete revascularization Strategy should be the uh, gold standard of a uh, strategy for patients with a STEMI and the multivasal disease, and that means treating the uh, treating the significant disease vessels in an uh, index procedure or a uh, stage procedure. So I appreciate uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Uh, Go, and Dr. Lee's outstanding talks and the case presentation. Uh, thank, thanks, uh, the distinguished uh, panelists, our good friends. And you made the symposium very successful. So uh, I would like to close this session. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.